Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Schriever Space Power Forum series. Uh, today, we're pleased to have two senior National Guard leaders from two of the states that provide vital space missions and expertise for the nation. Uh, Brigadier General Steve uh, Buteau and General Mike Vallea. General Buteau serves as Commander, California Air National Guard. In this role, he's a primary advisor to the Adjutant General on all programs, strategic planning, and operations affecting the California Air National Guard. General Vallea serves as the Assistant Adjutant General Air, Florida National Guard, and the Commander, Florida Air National Guard. He's responsible for mission readiness, ops, and coordination of the 10 Florida Air National Guard units across the state. So welcome, gentlemen, and thanks very much for making the time to join us today to discuss the critical topic of the role of the National Guard, uh, or the role that it should have in the Space Force. So what I'd like to do is kick things off today by giving each of you an opportunity to give every one of our listeners uh, some opening remarks on your perspectives in this regard. So, General Buteau, why don't you kick this thing off and then uh, we'll follow it up with uh, General Vallejo. Absolutely, sir. I'd like to open this up by sharing a bit about my own Air Force experience as a member of the Air National Guard and then share some insights about the space professionals who serve in the Air National Guard today. I love our Air Force. Uh, my dad joined the Air National Guard at the age of 18 and retired as a chief with 41 years of time in service. He inspired me to enter the Air Guard, which I did as an airman first class. I fell in love with the rescue mission, was commissioned and selected to attend undergraduate pilot training at Laughlin Air Force Base, Texas. On the first day of flight instruction, flight line instruction, my uh, flight commander asked, how many of us have graduated from the Air Force Academy? Arm shot up. I, uh, how many from ROTC, you know, arms like that, and then, and then how many were from guard? There were two of us in the back. He said, I see. Well, get over it because you're all the same now. We were all airmen. It was my first indoctrination to the full, total force construct and a lesson, life lesson in, in uh, inclusion. I graduated special ops school shortly after the opening salvos of Operation Desert Storm in 1991. My first of 10 expeditionary deployments was to Dahran Air Base, where our air crews lived in Kobar Towers, on due to two deployments before they were targeted by, uh, by terrorists in the region, killing and injuring many of my fellow rescue brethren from the 920th Rescue Wing in 1996. I returned several times to Southwest Asia, supporting Operation Southern Watch, Operation Provide Comfort 2, and then Operation Northern Watch, where General Deptulo was my commander at an Insulak Air Base in Turkey. I was a squadron DO at Al Jabber, Kuwait, when the uh, World Trade Center was attacked on 9-11 and participated in CSAR crisis action planning for Operation Enduring Freedom at both PSAB and NES Bahrain. I returned to Insulik in 2002 and prepped for Operation Iraqi Freedom and wound up demonstrating uh, ACE unexpectedly in the spring of 2003 by rapidly deploying our rescue forces, 130s to Constanta, Romania. Uh, and the H-60s uh, pushed into the Kurdish territories of North, northern Iraq. In 2005, I made my first oper operational deployment to the KAOC as Deputy Director of the JSRC and uh, returned as the CENTAF Ford A3 Chief of Personnel Recovery in 2007. General Deptulo was a mentor uh, who made his way through the KAOC occasionally uh, during those tours. I worked for five CFACs during combat and contingencies, and I'm very honored by the mentorship that they and other senior leaders provided me as an airman. I was never treated differently because of my guard status. No one ever asked. I was an airman, that was that. I gained incredible experience that I brought back and applied to my Title 32 status um, to emergency response operations in California and the homeland. As a commander of combat forces, I presented seven Air Force crosses and buried too many friends who sacrificed all while serving our nation. They never stopped loving our Air Force. My experience is not unique. There are countless airmen who serve uh, honorably as guardsmen, performing missions and integrating capabilities across the domains of air, space, and cyber. They do so proudly in their communities and the, and the service of their state and nation. For many in America, they are the face of our Air Force. The Total Force is a combat-proven model that has provided a surge to war capability for several decades 
Through the training and integration of active reserve and National Guard Airmen, we train to a common standard of readiness serving nearly every mission and Air Force Corps function, including space. It's made us the greatest Air Force on planet Earth. We should not take that for granted. Our space professionals in the Air Guard are no different. They've been providing combat capabilities in support of our Air Force for three decades. On average, these airmen have nearly 10 years of experience in their space career fields. One of three space units under my command, the 148th uh, Space Operations Squadron, provides nearly half of the continuous combat and, uh, command and control for MILSTAR and the advanced extremely high frequency satellite constellations, our nation's most secure communication satellites that support the National Command Authority and many other critical missions. They are often recognized as the best amongst the best and trusted stewards of this uh, strategic capability. Our space airmen and the Air National Guard apply their expertise to innovate new capabilities used to detect and monitor wildfires, track first responders, and improve situational awareness for incident commanders. They are silent professionals whose contributions have been marginalized by unnamed critics within our bureaucracy. Their story is more compelling and deserving of recognition. An airman in one of my other space units, Second Lieutenant Roy Davis, was recently selected as the Space Operation Command's Company Grade Officer of the Year. This Guardsman has been serving alongside Guardians of the 7th Space Warning Squadron, providing early warning for missile defense at Beale Air Force Base, California, and has done so with distinction. As we speak, there are activated Air National Guard airmen currently deployed or stationed overseas, uh, providing critical space capabilities in support of UCOM, AFRICOM, and Indopaycom. They do so not knowing their fate going into this next fiscal year. Most of these airmen have only known the space mission. They love the Air Force, but long to be part of the Space Force. Last fall, the California Air National Guard hosted a delegation from Ukraine at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Ukraine has been California's state partner since 1993. We've trained together and built lasting relationships on trust that continue to this day. The jury's still out, but consensus says the National Guard has done a pretty uh, darn good job with its state partnership program. Ukraine has a National Guard and an aspiring uh, Space Force. They, like nearly half of our 93 state partners globally, want, to want us to assist them to train and integrate air, space, and cyber capabilities. The Chief of Space Operations should have a Space National Guard to accomplish this vital mission. General, Brown, General Brown's Accelerate Change or Lose reminds us that our most valued resource is our people. With China as a pacing competitor and Russia as an extremist threat, now is not the time to be eliminating more than a thousand airmen from the ranks of our total space force. They represent talent from the most innovative space companies, academic institutions, labs, and other government agencies. They are culturally and linguistically uh, diverse and include seasoned weapons school graduates who contribute to the development of new tactics and combat capabilities. They are part of General Raymond's most valued resource as well, our nation's guardians. It will take years and precious resources to, re, uh, to reconstitute lost space uh, combat and support capabilities if the Space National Guard does not occur. Conversely, it is rather effortless to establish the Space National Guard and reunite these guardians with their peers in the Space Force. Secretary Kendall has challenged us to be ready and focused on enduring competition with China. In order to do so, we should follow sound doctrinal principles that assure unity of command and unity of effort are retained by establishing the Space National Guard as a component of the total Space Force. In other words, one mission, to one commander. Thank you. Hey, that's great. Mike, over to you. Hey, thank you, General Daptula, and uh, I want to thank the Mitchell Institute for uh, Aerospace Studies for the important work that you all do in furthering the education awareness of, uh, of critical space topics such as this one. And thank you for having me as, as a guest speaker today. Let me start with a quick disclaimer that I'm here today as a state employee of the Florida Air National Guard in a Title 32 status. I am not representing the administration's position in the establishment of the Space National Guard. This is important because our uh, active duty and uh, fellow Title 10 National Guard members uh, have been directed uh, to support the administration. So I'm, I'm solely a state employee of the Florida National Guard. I've been fortunate to have been in the Air National Guard from day one, almost 37 years ago. Currently, uh, I'm part-time working the NORAD mission. However, I did the NORAD mission for 27 years. To me, there's not a more important mission than defending our country. Uh, today, the preponderance of forces defending our homeland 24-7 are members of the Air National Guard, along with the Army National Guard and the National Capital Region. 
However, while supporting the federal mission of Homeland Defense on a full-time status, on different occasions, I had the opportunity throughout those years to also support my state in multiple disasters, hurricanes, wildfires, pandemic, pandemic response, and also travel to other states to support. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what space professionals in the Air National Guard do today and can continue to do so if we establish a Space National Guard. They can conduct and do the mission while being, made, while being available to support our state and our country a true force multiplier for our nation. The Florida Air National Guard specifically has been involved in space since 1995. We have over 27 years of experience in space providing rapidly deployable satellite communications, space launch, range command and control, electromagnetic warfare. We maintain a unit equipped search to war capability at 60% less cost to taxpayers. 58% of our unit have a bachelor's degree or higher and 40% of our members are full-time employees. I'm sorry, 40% of our part-time members are full-time civilian employees with the Department of Defense or aerospace industry partners such as Raytheon, L3 Harris, Lockheed Martin, SpaceX, and Northrop Grumman. Finally, our members in Florida have an average of eight years of space experience. The Air National Guard has participated in four different Department of Defense studies to determine the best way for the Space Force to establish a reserve component. All four studies concluded the same thing, that the most effective and efficient way to establish a reserve component is to create a separate Space National Guard and to establish a full-time, part-time United Space Force component. These results have not been communicated to Congress nor the public because of the administration's current position of not establishing the Space National Guard. Department of the Air Force leadership recently testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee last that they cannot do the space mis mission without the Guard. It's also been mentioned that there's only two options for how we effectively and efficiently keep the Guard performing these missions. One, either have a separate National Guard or two, take the capabilities in the Guard and move them into this one component. Let me tell you a little bit about creating a Space National Guard. We do that, you do not lose any of the critical capability that the Guard already brings to the warfighter right now. The cost of creating a Space National Guard has been up for debate. The Congressional Budget Office released a report in 2020 entitled Cost of Creating a Space National Guard. To sum it up, the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, General Hookerson, explained that the actual cost is about $200,000. That's just to change our name tapes in our uniforms put a sign outside the buildings and the flags of each of those units. Those units already exist. They're already performing the mission. We don't need any military construction or infrastructure. We're basically just taking the folks doing the mission today. And instead of the Air Force, they'll say Space Force on their name tags. For about $200,000, you can establish the Space National Guard. If we move those space missions and that those personnel performed by the Air National Guard into the Space Force single component, then the Space Force will incur significant costs and more importantly, a degradation of space capabilities. There are currently 1,000 plus Air National Guard members performing state missions in seven states and one territory. These airmen will remain in the Guard and reassign to viable Air Force missions within our states. Current personnel operations and maintenance and basic work costs for these missions is approximately $70 million per year, and United States Air Force support costs of approximately $33 million per year. There will also be a one-time military construction cost up to $500 million and one-time training and readiness costs of $72 million to establish this uh, single component. Also, the Space Force will have to train their new guardians and build new facilities to house them and their equipment. So all in all, the single component will cost above $600 million to establish versus $200,000, $600 million versus $200,000 to create a National Guard. In closing, the there will also be a capability loss while transitioning those missions to the U.S. Space Force single component. We have pulled about a thousand of our National Guard members work in space today, and over 90% said they would not transfer out of the Guard into the Space Force single component. Therefore, we will decrement our war fighting readiness up to 42 months to train new guardians and seven to 10 years 
to regain the expertise that currently resides in existing Air National Guard units like the one I have in Florida. In closing, having only two viable options, it is clear that creating the Space National Guard is the only effective and efficient one for the American people and the Department of Defense and the only option that will allow the Space Force to maintain its current space capabilities. Thank you, sir. Well, look, thank you both very much for those opening remarks. Um, and what I'd like to do now is, is uh, ask you all a couple of questions to dig down deeper uh, into some of these talk topics uh, before we open it up to the audience for Q&A. So both of you kind of touched on this one, um, but in, in one of you mentioned that the debate over whether or not to establish a Space National Guard actually goes back before the establishment of the Space Force in 2019. Um, as you mentioned, the Guards performed vital space missions since the early 1990s. And our senior space leaders have said that the Guard's vital to the mission of the Space Force, yet there seems to be this opposition in the administration to establish a Space Guard. Um, specifically, civilians in the OMB, uh, National Security Council staff, and inside OSD. So could you succinctly give us your perspectives on why the Guard uh, should continue in the space mission as the reserve component of the say of the space force I get, I can uh, lead off uh, by uh, quoting another mentor uh, uh, retired general John Hyten who uh, when asked uh, the same question said well because it's already been built just turn it on uh, you know the uh, as I mentioned and um, and um, and uh, Mike uh, validated, you know, we, this is capability that already exists. We're using it. Uh, the the operational employments with everything going on in UCOM, you know, the the, the need uh, is only grown. It's not reducing. So the um, so I, I think part of this, you know, um, we're uh, we're so woven into the fabric of the Air Force that may, maybe it's not as obvious to those outside of the uh, the military. Uh, and uh, that's a good thing, but this it's a it's a horrible thing when we come to uh, uh, decisions like this that are mainly made on spreadsheets, not not necessarily uh, uh, with uh, with the with all the capabilities in mind. You know, the National Guard um, since its inception, I mean, you know, we're talking about 1636. It's it's really the the cornerstone of our national security and defense, and um, and our you know we actually have it in our in our charter uh, to be the uh, the strategic uh, response force uh, for our nation's wars. Uh, and we should not be playing back on that just because we've entered another domain, um, you know, the domain of space. Space is the glue that ties everything together. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and that's gonna be more apparent in the, in, the, in the decades that come as the space force really op uh, achieves its full operational maturity. And um, and we need we need airmen of all flavors who and guardians who know how to integrate and, and bring those capabilities back uh, to the warfighter, not just at the strategic level. So um, I'll turn it over to Mike for uh, for his insights. Hey, thank you. Well, it's kind of hard to top that General Hyden uh, statement. You know, it's already been built. You know, if I had to uh, translate it to an airplane, it's uh, it's an airplane that. Uh, uh, fueled up, weapons loaded, pilot ready to go, maintenance crews operating uh, daily, and uh, you're just going to push that aside and, and start all over. I mean, it's, it's effective. It's proven it's effective. Um, the, the men and women that, like I alluded to earlier, support and work space in the Air National Guard can also do the domestic response. And uh, I think our nation is, uh, uh, has seen the value uh, throughout the years, but no more than the last two years when the National Guard uh, throughout all 54 responded to the pandemic, to the pandemic. So, uh, uh, so to me, it, it's, uh, it, it's kind of hard to get past the fact that it's, it's built, it's operating, it's proven, it's conducting war fighting capable missions as we speak uh, throughout the world. And uh, I just uh, can't seem to comprehend how we can just start all over. So, 
And, and uh, I should include preparation of the battle space if you consider how we're effectively using our state partnership program, which is very unique to the, uh, to the National Guard and uh, really needs to uh, be extended uh, full force into, into uh, supporting uh, John Raymond with the Space Force. Well, thank you both for that. I mean, I, I think those were good, clear answers. Um, I often think back at the time I was a Combined Air and Space Operations Center commander during the opening stages of Operation Enduring Freedom, and there was a situation that arose, and, you know, the first thing I thought of was, hey, I uh, need to employ this particular capability that's available um, from uh, our space component at the time. Um, well, that capability is now resident in uh, uh, in the guard units, in many guard units, um, uh, but they're space-based capabilities. So I I'm having a hard time understanding the reticence to turn on the switch, as General uh, Hyten said, because the capability is already there. Um, now, one of the supposed excuses um, is, uh, is space guard is too expensive. Um, you already made the point that the Biden administration doesn't support a Space National Guard. And one of the reasons was a Congressional Budget Office report that said it was too expensive. So as the two Guard leaders, um, familiar with the analysis conducted numerous times, and I think, Bucky, you brought this up, um, can you give us some insight into the cost of what a Space National Guard would really be? now? Uh, Mike mentioned, I think it was Mike that, that mentioned uh, some relative costs, but could you remind us again of the differential between the two options? Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, why don't you lead off on this one and then I'll, uh, I'll try and chime in so I don't get too snarky. So. Yes, yes, sir. So I'm, uh, just to rehash what I said earlier, um, uh, and this is uh, supported and validated by our chief of the National Guard Bureau. It's slightly over two hundred thousand dollars. Just taking name tapes, and say U.S. Air Force, your name, changing them to blue name tapes that say Space Force, and uh, we'll probably have to spend a little money on the extra, on the flag that uh, I think they're wearing a, a color flag. Um, change maybe some uh, the the unit flag out and uh, and a sign outside the building. Other than that, we keep operating as we do day to day. Uh, nothing will change that that personnel will remain administratively controlled under the state work for the adjutant general uh, administratively operationally obviously they'll support the space force so uh, so the cost is really name tapes flags and, and signs on the building well, so what, what is this CBO report talking about Bucky you have an insight on the uh, before yeah. I, uh, opportunity yeah I, I and frankly, I, j I just wish that they had engaged the uh, uh, the Air National Guard. And um, I don't, I don't quite honestly, I don't know if they engaged the, the Space Force, but the but the um, the underlying assumptions in the in the Congressional Budget Office report was looking at a full stand up of a Space National Guard component that would touch all 54 states and territories uh, with a totally separate um, uh, chain of command. Uh, separate from the Air and the Army National Guard, and uh, and it, it was just a exploded mess. And you know, was, and quite frankly, we don't need that much uh, space capability, right? So uh, what we have right now, everything we have is you know, UTC tasked. You know, those are validated requirements that that our our Space National Guard Airmen are are performing in seven states uh, in one territory, right? So that's this is that's that's what it is. It's a thousand people. And uh, and uh, on a Title Ten side at National Guard Bureau, um, you know they 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 did the right thing. They said, "Hey, look, this is we're this is going to be a this, all we're going to do is we're going to move these forces over at the state level, like where Mike and I have. We'll be a combined air and space uh, command, right? Uh, there's no additional uh, senior leaders in this. There's a space operations um, office at NGB that already coordinates space activities." Uh, with the yeah, with the two star uh, doing that, that's already happening. Um, and as you know, uh, uh, General Detulo, you know the uh, the guard, uh, you know the way it's always been built across all of our weapon systems. It's a seventy thirty mix. There's basically about thirty percent full time 
and 70% drill status. You can't come up with those kind of uh, what numbers that equate it to the cost of, of, uh, of an active squadron. And that's not what the intent. Now we have exceptions. Uh, I have a unit, the 148, uh, as I mentioned in my, in my opener, that, uh, that does uh, you know, command control for Millstar. And, well, uh, that is a 24-7, 365 operation. But those costs are clearly established. We've been doing it for 24 years. <laughs> so the, and, uh, uh, and, and I'm concerned because the, there's hidden costs. The, the, the hidden costs are if you just put all this on to the active Space Force component, who's trying to posture for future, future mission areas. Um, you know, a thousand people is, you know, quite a bit, quite a chunk of their, of their operational capacity from, uh, from Guardians. Um, who's looked at those costs? So I, I, I think it was, I, I'm going to say that the, uh, the CBO was a, a quick look, a, uh, a, um, a, a, an estimate uh, that was done with, with uh, a couple of models, but not a lot of information. Uh, I bet you that they would be uh, chomping at the bit to, uh, to take a fresh look at that, given what the proposal that's already been agreed to between, uh, between the, um, uh, the active and the, and the National Guard you know, personnel involved. So, well, one would yeah. think that uh, you know, perhaps after we highlight some of these issues, they might do so. But it sounds to me from your answers that um, they were looking like starting from scratch and making sure every state had a, a piece. And, and that's not what you're suggesting. Uh-uh. Um, it, it's capitalize on what's there. Um, change Air Force to Space Force right. and or Space Air Guard to Space Guard and let's move on. Well, I'll, right? I'll remind you of something else. It wasn't that long ago that we had to constitute cyber capabilities, right? And um, and we didn't have that discussion. Um, and and it's it started small. Of course, cyber has grown because there's a there's it it's a it's a huge attack surface for our nation. But it, but it was it, it grew to meet requirements. Uh, the other thing about the cyber is is that we needed it in, in areas where we had the density of, of, of reservist populations that could, that could actually support the mission set. They, had this, they already had the skills. Space is, is really the same thing. So uh, there's, there's parts of this country where it's going to be difficult to, to, uh, to drive a lot of space um, you know, talent from the local community, um, unless it's a destination location. So, but, uh, so I, I think a reasonable person's analysis there will uh, will see that as well. So, well, listen as a follow up uh, to that, I've heard that OMB directed the full absorption of the Air National Guard space units and equipment into the Space Force within a couple of years. Is that a cheaper alternative to establishing a Space National Guard? Absolutely not, sir. Um, that's the uh, the, the six hundred million dollars plus uh, to do that versus the two hundred thousand dollars. Uh, that it costs to establish the, the National Guard. So that those numbers are, are, are valid. They've been supported by everyone at the leadership of the National Guard. Uh, so absorbing it will be uh, against 600 to $700 million uh, in everything I've previously mentioned uh, to include uh, retraining. And, the, and you know, sir, the, the, as an operator too, the, the, an important piece is losing that uh, war, war readiness, the, uh, the the readiness factor that uh, you know that we provide. It'll take seven to ten years to train new guardians to get them up to speed to where we, as the Air National Guard, are right now. So uh, yeah, and it kind of undercuts the whole purpose, and the and it was not the purpose, but it's the advantage that accrues to the whole guard model in the first place. And you know, some of these folks that are. Uh, well, I, 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 it, it, it's pretty incredible to me uh, some of the, the, the rationale that, that, that folks are coming up with as opposed to ignoring the obvious solution that's right there clearly in front of them. Uh, but I digress. Here's another one for you. This is rather simplistic, but given the perceptions out there about keeping bureaucracy to a minimum with the creation of the Space Force in the first place, one of the options that the Senate floated last year was the renaming of the Air National Guard into the Air and Space National Guard. Is this a good idea? And if so, why? And if not, why not? 
Uh, I'll lead off on that. Uh, it's well, it's a new idea, uh, but the, but it, what it does is that it, it fails to recognize the way that we operate. You know, uh, we are creatures of doctrine, and doctrine comes from lessons learned in the battle space. Um, I ended my uh, opener talking about unity of command, unity of effort. These are very important uh, concepts. You know, sir, uh, as a commander, if you don't own it, you don't control it. How can you rely on it, right? And uh, somebody else is going to have a higher priority for that capability. It's unfair um, to uh, to create the space force and then tie the arm behind the chief of space operations back because you give them a less than a full complement uh, of capability uh, when we talk about a total space force. Uh, now, and there's I actually I'm a big supporter of these initiatives to bring in other part time uh, talent and things have rotational people come in from an industry. That's awesome. You know that we uh, you know we should be doing the same thing. We actually do in a state capacity because we have flexibility to do that under the initial um, uh, initial militia construct. But the uh, but uh, uh, when it comes to actual war fighting uh, capability and and um, yeah, closing the door to uh, seasoned professionals who are actually doing it right now. You know, how do you transition that? I mean, it's just like we're, we're not going to like redeploy these people back, leave the equipment in place, and then and, and hope that we have a, a force. It, the estimates are it will take 42 months uh, to train, um, you know, guardians, uh, active duty guardians to take over these responsibilities. Uh, that's that's uh, that's not, you know, if you look at where we are, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the two front uh, war uh, uh, 1939 as uh, things with uh, what's going on in Europe and in the Pacific. This is not a time when we should be uh, making uh, that kind of uh, wild reductions uh, to our to our combat capability. Uh, CQ Brown reminds us that uh, yeah the weapon systems don't just operate themselves. You know you have to have like uh, you have to have you know professional airmen and guardians uh, to make the mission happen. Um, that's it. You, know, you can't you can't balance that on a spreadsheet. Sorry, it doesn't happen. Hey, sir. You know the the impact. It, I'll make a few points. Is uh, the, the think about the readiness standards and compliance navigating through two separate services. Increased complication in budgeting, funding execution, personnel management. You know it's counter to the stated intent of the CSO, which is service aligned forces with a singular focus on space war fighting. Completely contrary to that. Competition for resources, priorities, you know, within one organization uh, is heavily weighted towards the Air Force and Air and Space Force priorities. You know, the misalignment remains, it will remain between the Air National Guard and subordinate space forces. Uh, so it, it's just, a, uh, it's not an accurate representation, representation of forces. Uh, it, it's just, it, it doesn't really do anything. But uh, anyway, it's a, uh, it is not a good idea to rename the airspace national guard. Okay, well, thanks for that, Mike. And you, 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 some of what you just said kind of fits into uh, what I think uh, your response is going to be to this next question, and that's that. There's another thought out there that's been uh, promoted, and that's just to keep things as they are with the lion's share of the guard space capabilities and personnel in the Air National Guard, and not create a new Space National Guard. Uh, wouldn't keeping the status quo be sufficient to address the mission needs of the Space Force and combatant commanders? And if not, what are some of the disconnects? And you already mentioned a couple of them. I, I did, sir. And, uh, you know, uh, I like to state it as such that uh, our Air National Guard space professionals will still be orphaned. Uh, they are, you know, working operationally for the Space Force while remaining in the Air National Guard. And, and you know, all the previous points that I mentioned yeah. will apply uh you know personal readiness will diminish due to growing disconnects across the, the the space force and the air national guard uh increased bureaucracy and, and man hours you know funding for air, air national guard space units require significant workarounds we have to now work with headquarters air force and headquarters space force the national guard bureau um you know and personal deployments you know to meet space force wartime requirements currently have an impact and delay due to cross-service process issues. Uh, so to me, that's a steady state that, uh, you know, we are, we are being challenged right now. We're working through it because in the Air Guard, we're great professionals that want to get the mission done and we'll get the job done. But uh, 
there is definitely a cleaner, more efficient way to do it, and that is a space manager card. A bucky. Yeah, yeah uh, I just paint a me mental picture for yourself. Close your eyes and imagine what that org chart looks like. And then think about the types of threats that we are confronted with today. Hypersonic threats, time sensitive things. You know, we don't need, you know, we shouldn't be creating uh, a, a command and control quagmire. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we, what we should be doing is we should be enabling um, both our chief of staff at the Air Force and our chief of space operations with, with ready, uh, responsive combat capabilities that deploy in different ways. They support different uh, customers, um, and you know, uh, and it, you know, the everything that we're working on. But does you know, the highest priority in the Department of Defense is is uh, digitally integrating uh, the entire force. Space is a huge part of that, and so we uh, every obstacle we put in the way of airmen is really that that comes back on, on leadership. Uh, they don't deserve that. They deserve better, and um, and they deserve to have. A commander uh, that that basically is vested, and and uh, and can organize, train, and equip them uh, in, in the mission set that they're doing. Uh, I mentioned the the not just the pride, but the sacrifice uh, that uh, airmen and uh, future guardians will make on behalf of their country. Let's not set them up for failure from the get go. Um, the total force construct is proven. Yeah, we've had some rough. Uh, you know, uh, uh, things happened over the years, but the, but we learned from those, and and we made the total force even better. And uh, the best thing I could see uh, uh, under the stewardship of uh, Secretary Kendall is that we we start with that with the total force construct in the Space Force as a, as a point of departure, and uh, give them a Space National Guard capabilities, and then and then we'll make we'll just uh, over time uh, to meet the needs of the Space Force. Hey, sir, and to, to pile on really quick, if I may, the, uh, you know, a, a, an example that's going to uh, hit us in the face here pretty soon is uh, the Space Force is going to have their own basic training starting here in a couple of months. Uh, so uh, they were going to send their guardians to basic training for Space Force. We cannot do that. We cannot send our Air National Guard members to Space Force basic training. So we'll, we'll have uh, space operators at times sitting side by side, one Air Force, one Space Force, Pretty much doing the same thing when in fact you know we should be you know aligned under one service over no i got it and uh you know bucky when you were talking about a uh, convoluted organizational diagram i could only think of one organizational diagram that would be more convoluted and that's the one in 2010 um, that put air force cyber capabilities into Space Command, but left the service cryptologic component commander in another MAGCOM. Yeah. I mean, it's not unlike what some people are suggesting. So you have, you know, capacity split uh, and leadership split between two major commands. It, it was insanity. Right. Yeah. And finally, we got that straight by moving them back all where they should have been in the first place into a unified command um 16th air force but that's another subject area but that's the only other one that is so was so frapping ridiculous people couldn't understand what they were doing well i i, I mentioned earlier that uh before this uh conference call that that i just got back from hawaii uh because you know at the end of pacific is that's 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 the that's that's for the game that's the central you know, uh, center of gravity for everything that we need to be focusing on. And these poor people are pouring their hair out because they, that's how can they plan, right? Who, who, where are the coordination authorities? Who, who, uh, who actually can actually tell these forces what to do, where to go? Uh, and, and that's, that's, it's unfair again to the, to the people at the operational and tactical level. We're going to have to, um, uh, perform with some agility in a decentralized C2 environment. <laughs> they don't, we don't need to, how this on anymore, and uh, and at the same time, I think the uh, in fairness, uh, the administration, Congress, they should hold us accountable to the remarks that we're making, um, and say, look, you know, this, you say, well, let's go do this, and uh, and, and, and this, you know, better not be some sort of, uh, you know, uh, roundabout play to uh, 
to, to do something different. I don't think we need that because the, the reality is, is that we have the best leadership in the active uh, guard and reserve uh, out there. And, uh, and, we, and, um, and they're, 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 they're gonna work together. They just need a little guidance you know, from, from, uh, from leadership. Okay, let's uh, let, let's kind of. I want to get through the this next question here before we move it to the audience. But um, it, it, let's move from the federal level to the state level because some have questioned why the states need space forces in the first place. So what's the rationale for that? And wouldn't it be better to move all the space forces into a Title Ten only organization? Hmm. Mike, why don't you go for that one first? <laughs> Sir, we, we remain, the National Guard remains our primary combat reserve component. Um, you know, we're federally trained to meet the nation's war fighting demands. And, and I, I want to focus on the dual status capability that we can use at state and federal level. Um, you know, we do it in every other war fighting domain across the spectrum. Uh, it, it's a proven method. It, uh, it's been validated. It's, uh, we continue to do it. Um, so to say that the states need missions, uh, why do states need uh, space missions? Uh, it, it's uh, obviously to sustain our war fighting capability uh, and uh, that search for war capability that our nation needs. Uh, and again, use those dual role multi, you know, the Air Force talks about multi-capable airmen. Well, uh, I would challenge uh, anyone to find more multi-capable airmen more than in the Air National Guard or, or the Army National Guard for that matter. So uh, because of what we do on the civilian side and on the and on the federal side. So uh, it just uh, it's kind of hard to top or um, to to understand, you know, how uh, Space National Guard men and women professionals that are doing or men and women in this in, uh, in the Air National Guard that are doing space right now uh, can be any, anything could be more efficient than that. So uh, over. Yeah, so uh, so let's let's have a little just a glimpse. I, I'm gonna brag for just a second. So um, I have five wings, right? And um, uh, the 144th Fighter Wing sustains 24/7, 365 uh, air sovereignty or uh, for the West Coast of the United States, but, uh, and they and they do that uh, in a Title 10 uh, status uh, operationally, but they're still doing Title 32 missions. It's a wing, and it's got a lot of resource. And they also supported a, uh, a recent exercise up in up in Alaska, where they're honing skills for the uh, the future fight. Uh, my rescue wing, uh, you know, normally Title Thirty Two, they just went on this last weekend and did a long range over water rescue. Um, uh, that's they specialized in that because we're we're on the Pacific Rim. We are relevant by geography. These units are there. They and and they're they're combat capable. Uh, there are there are good arguments for uh, going back through policy and making some uh, some updates to some of our uh, Title Ten U.S. codes so that so that commanders um, on active duty have more flexibility to how they use the guard. Um, you know that was evident uh, with uh, with our rapid response to support the commander of UCOM um, with the with the Ukraine crisis. So the so uh, these things are uh, you know uh, can be I have five thousand. Airmen and and future guardians in my uh, state Air National Guard, and they're not running up a Title Ten bill every day, but they're training in Title through Thirty Two status. They're they're doing missions. They're supporting the state. Um, but then, if if not space, then why do I need fighters? Why do I need rescue? Why do I need MQ nines? Why do why do I need uh, cyber? Why you know. Uh, you know, California is the fifth largest economy on planet Earth. So maybe I don't need any, any of that stuff. Well, what you're doing now, you know, the military already is 1% of the population. And we're gonna cut that back and make it so it's a fraction of a percent of, of the population. Uh, when we have two, uh, you know, uh, you know, crazy autocrats who are uh, uh, staring down and and, uh, and uh, wanted to find the, uh, the, the, the global power structure. This is not the time to be having these kind of uh, uh irrational conversations actually uh it's not rational and, and i would invite anybody to come out any day of the week and see these airmen in action and uh and what they accomplish they love the air force they love the space force 
uh, it, it's it's cruel and unusual to tell these uh, guardians that they can't uh, do the mission that they love for the nation that they love, right? And uh, we are the United States after all. So, <laughs> so I'm just yeah, gonna- no, listen, let me jump in there and just suggest that it undermines the whole concept of uh, citizen warrior. Uh, mm-hmm. I will just add to your, uh, look, I was never in the guard, but I'm a huge fan because part of what the guard does is tie our nation's defense to all of the states. Mm-hmm. Okay, because there are states out there that don't have active duty bases. Yeah. Um, and it is that interlocutor, if you will, between the American citizenry mm-hmm. and the defense of the nation that is one element that not too many people talk about very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to get rid of the space guard, but defer to guard elements in the other domains simply undercuts and doesn't realize a unique way that, as you mentioned, Bucky, uh, Americans have and want to have to participate and contribute to their own defense. That's right. Uh, Anyway, I I digress. This gets a bit emotional, but it's an extraordinarily important subject area and point. So what we're going to do now is open the session to questions from the audience. Uh, And as a reminder to our listeners, although I see some old hats in here, you can participate in the Q&A by using the raise hand function on your device. And then when I call on you, please unmute your mic and then state your name and affiliation. Uh, And you can also submit a question in writing using uh, the the Q&A function. And and we already have um, a couple of those and not seeing any hands jumping up. Um, come on, Sandra, don't be bashful. <laughs> um, let, me, let me turn and offer you one from uh, Pam Powers. And Pam asks, um, will the CBO doing another score that focuses on just the seven states in one territory who are already involved in space operations rather than all the 50 states? Seems like a logical question. What do you all have to say? Well, I, I think the first thing that should happen is, you know, there's uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. There's language that specifically requested uh, these reports uh, from the department. And, uh, and, I, and I think uh, those reports will, will provide that data. Remember, this is not a new idea. Most, most of this uh, analysis was done uh, ahead of time. And then, and if, and if there are legislative leaders uh, believe that uh, uh, another congressional um, audit is required, and then so be it. Um, you asked earlier about you know status quo and uh, whether we could preserve this. Uh, it's not functional, but we can't. You know, we could preserve this, but guess what? This is not going away. I mean, the, the this is every uh, those of us with who are responsible. Uh, for these airmen and, and future guardians, we'll, we'll keep this on the legislative uh, plate uh, as long as necessary uh, to get this done. Why? Because we care for our nation. And this, this is just a, it's the wrong decision at the wrong time. Um, so we, we uh, uh, but yeah, we fully participate in whatever's required to, uh, to make sure that everybody's comfortable with the numbers. Hey, sir, and uh, it is my understanding that uh, co- uh, members of Congress have asked multiple times the CBO to uh, to rescore, uh, and uh, they have not done it. So, uh, mm-hmm. so the the answer to that question is hard because uh, and even the initial report the the, the Air Force nor the National Guard were uh, consulted. Uh, so, uh, they've all asked all members of Congress uh, that have all members of Congress that have asked for it. Uh, they have refused to rescore the report. Over. Okay, thank you. Here's a bit of a related question from uh, Chris Smith. Um, would there be an additional staff cost? Um, he, he's thinking of per a, a duplication of the existing NGBA staff, or you know, would, would, would there be synergies that you might capitalize, uh-huh. as is the current um, Space Force staff with Department of the Air Force? Um, uh, functions. 
Well, I'll, I'll lead off on that. So um, a lot of thoughts gone into this. As I said, most most of this forest structure already exists, and uh, and uh, we already have a space operations uh, office at the National Guard Bureau, and and that's important because when you're Title Thirty Two, the National Guard Bureau is is basically our our gateway to the to Title Ten. So we have people in the Pentagon that uh, that are responsible for uh, coordinating and, and tasking these space capabilities and so that that already exists um the unit structure already exists and in uh, and and in states uh you know certainly like california where we have multiple units we'll have one or two people in our in our uh in our air staff uh that will basically help uh support but it's uh we're already functioning this way now all this you know the you know that we're functioning like a space national guard within the air national guard and uh the only thing is is that the uh you know uh guys like me uh retain the um you know the the uh, uh operational control uh of the of the force and um and that's that's fine we we've we've done this before in different mission areas uh, this is not going to be a, a problem here but uh but uh Eventually, it was it is going to be important, and I think this is where this uh, the plan for the space force having flexibility to rotate people in and out. You know, I, I told you about all the things that I did, uh, mostly on in an active duty status, uh, developing as a future leader in both joint and and uh, uh, and staff assignments uh, supporting uh, uh, combat air forces. Uh, we need that to make sure that our guardians uh, can, can make a career and and develop and be future uh, commanders of their forces, uh, whether it's uh, at the squadron or the Delta, or or at the uh, the NGBSO level. So um, so you know the career continuity is important, but they can just you know most of our uh, Space National Guard forces are co-located uh, conveniently with uh, with our Space Force counterparts. So. So uh, some of that would be very easy to uh, accomplish. And sir, I have a, uh, just to give you a little vignette, I have my, my space unit, it's down at uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, and only, I'm not like Bucky, I don't have five wings in my state, I only have one. And it's headquarters at, headquartered at Jacksonville. Um, so the, the full-time professionals at, uh, at Cape Canaveral, you know, receive post base support uh, for a very myriad of things. Um, this part-time space professionals We'll send our uh, our doctors, our personnel uh, to help down to Cape Canaveral, uh, you know, just like we have other GSUs geographically separate units. If we turn the switch on and we become the Space National Guard, we would do it just the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I might have to create an MOU for official purposes uh, to work between the Space National Guard and the Air National Guard, but there's are still Space National Guard members in the state of Florida that work for the Adjutant General. So we would do things exactly the same way we do it right now. Oh, very good. Um, I, I did get Sandra to ask a question, but instead of raising her hand, she typed it in. So here it is. The Department of the Air Force submitted their report on April 1st, and it does not recommend a Space National Guard. Do you know if the Department of the Air Force is working on another study in response to congressional pushback from the first report? Thanks much. Sir, from my end, I do not know. Yeah, Bucky? I don't have any uh, further information about that other other than um, it, it was probably submitted based on the uh, uh, underlying assumptions from uh, CBO, uh, CBO and also uh, from administration uh, direction. Okay, here's an interesting question from an anonymous attendee. I normally don't answer or ask anonymous uh, questions, but it's a pretty good one. I may have missed in your comments, and if so, please forgive me, but I'm an ardently, ardently in support of a Space National Guard. But in the absence of them turning on this capability, and since we're only talking about seven states in one territory, could we employ the Navy militia model? So we actually have a Navy militia in, in California, and so I'm aware of this. And for those unacquainted, this is like really cool. So before World War One, um, you know, the Navy was 
was actually uh, fairly small. Uh, and uh, and when World War I started, the, uh, the uh, active component, the Navy basically activated all the state uh, naval militias, including from California, Massachusetts, New York, uh, other states that had them. And they started doing combat uh, training capability deployed uh, during World War I. And, and at the end of World War I, they constituted the Naval Reserve and transferred that capability into the Naval Reserve. Um, the Naval militia still exist in, in uh, states like California, but the authority is basically, uh, it's interesting. It's like a Title 10 authority and you can you can actually do both. Now there's some uh, there's some trade-offs uh, with it, of course, but the uh, but and they still report to the governor, which is amazing. So, um, but you know, uh, these these are more difficult uh, challenges uh, because because they're such a departure from what what uh, uh, the Air Force and the Department of the Air Force uh, is is used to. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, recommend going down that path. No. Mike, you want to add anything? Well, sir, I don't have a Navy militia in our state, but uh, I would uh, highly oppose uh, going down that route. Over. Yeah, I know. I mean, part of that. I mean, it's an interesting question, but the sure. fact of the matter is, and what you all have um, reiterated today is, look, this capability already exists. Well. Change the patches, change the names, and let's get on with business. That seems to be the most logical and common sense way to do this. But unfortunately, we've come to the end of this Space Power Forum, uh, and I'd like to offer a big thank you uh, again to Generals Vallea and uh, Buto for your time today and your continued service to our nation. Uh, and to you all and to our audience, from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day. Thank you.